So we're talking about friends in this video today. Yep. Right. After this, I need to set the fucking record straight on Ross Geller. So after this video, we're going to have a nice long shit on that character because I hate him. The show Friends is a bona fide pop culture juggernaut, and with rumours of a Friends movie constantly circulating and then immediately being shot down by the cast from their floating golden sky limos, I thought I'd pick everyone's spirits up by talking about how adorable the cast were in real life. Before the show even made it to air, co-creator David Crane was insistent that the show feature a pure ensemble cast. For those who don't know, what is an ensemble cast? Well, an ensemble cast is where a movie or TV show will feature a group of characters who all receive roughly the same amount of screen time. So think of something like The Avengers, where there's a lot of characters and a lot of like, big names, but they all have roughly equal screen time and credit. So why do you stress the word pure when you're talking about the ensemble cast? A lot of TV shows and movies do feature ensemble casts, but the problem is that more often than not, there will be that one breakout character who audience responds to more, who invariably just steals the scene, every scene they're in and becomes the focal point of the movie or show itself. So I think like Barney Stinson from How I Met Your Mother or Loki from the Avengers movies, where he's just so good in his role, he steals every fucking scene he's in until he's basically, they start making the show and movies more about him. Like if they rewrote the second Thor movie, after they realised how popular Loki was in the Avengers, to make it more about Loki. If you even think about betraying him, you'll kill me? Evidently there will be a line. To this end, David Crane and his co-creator Matt Kaufman structured each episode so it never focused entirely on one character or one pair of characters prominently, instead choosing to focus on the growing dynamic of the group as a whole. One of the ways they did this, you might think if you are, you're a big fan of Friends, that there's always one episode each season where every co different combination of the pairings of the Friends have at least one scene or storyline or mini plot point together. So you might notice well, even episodes that specifically focus on two characters, such as like when Ross and Rachel are arguing, they always put in little bits where like other scenes of the other characters talking as well to make sure that it doesn't entirely focus on those two characters. Rachel, come on, talk to me, please. I can't even look at you right now. What? Nothing, nothing. What nobody expected though is that the cast to get on board with this idea as well. For example, in the first season, all six friends were paid the same amount. However, in the second season, David Schwimmer and Jennifer Aniston, who played Ross and Rachel respectively, were each paid slightly more than all of their co-stars, presumably because that season focused on the dynamic of their growing relationship, which had become a popular thing with fans, and presumably because fuck Joey, I guess. The first season obviously established the dynamic then it became very obvious very quickly that the real thing that audience wanted was with the will they won't me of Ross and Rachel. So that's what the entire second season focused on really and that's why they got paid more. You deserve to be with someone who appreciates you, you know, and who gets how, how, how funny and sweet and amazing and adorable and sexy you are, you know? When the third season rolled around, the six members of the principal cast made the unusual decision to enter salary negotiations as a group, much to the surprise of Warner Brothers. Why did they do that? The thinking of the six members of the principal cast was that if they all entered their salary negotiations as a group, they could all ensure they all got the same money. Because I believe Schwimmer and Aniston were worried that them being paid more would cause resentment in the group, which would obviously affect the dynamic of episodes. We don't have as much money as you. So did they raise everyone else's salaries to match that? No, what Warner Brothers did, presumably in an attempt to like break them down, was they said, we'll offer to pay you all the exact same amount if Aniston and Schwimmer agree to take a substantial pay cut. Which they did? Yes, they did. Which like, obviously goes to show that they were committed to all going in as a group. Now what's more important, your friends or money? Friends! friends. And the thing about this is obviously Warner Brothers at first, they save money doing this. But when the next season rolled around, season four, and they all went in as a group again, they all had to have their salary raised equally by the same amount together. And I think by the very last season when they paid a million dollars an episode, pay us all the same or we all walk. And when you've got every, like you, you could perhaps get rid of one friend, maybe two, like they could write them out but all six friends, they've got no chance. They have basically got one of us by the ball. It's like, you pay us all this much money each, I'll be done. <laughs> <laughs> so 
they all managed to enter their contracts, get things like back-end royalties from syndication rights. And think of how often Friends is now showed everywhere. Every time they air an episode, like someone from that cast gets a payment somewhere down the line. You'll hear it a lot in a lot of modern TV shows. Usually, there is always a breakdown. It's always money. For example, do you know the show Hawaii Five-O? Uh, I'll have to bing it, I think. I'll... Yes, you do know, you remember. <laughs> like, this show, um, as the name suggests, is set in Hawaii. On that show, there are two main actors who are Asian. The two main cast who are Asian, they were being paid 15% less than their white co-stars. That just ain't right, bro. And one of them is, I think he's uh, Daniel, Daniel Kim. Uh, he's the guy from Lost, Jin from Lost, and also the voice of Johnny Gat from Saints Row. So this guy is fucking awesome. He went in with his female Asian co-star and said, we want to be paid the same as our white co-stars because this is kind of fucking bullshit because we're all doing the same amount of work. We're getting paid less and it's called Hawaii Five-0 and we're the only characters of Asian descent. And they said, no, so they left. So good on them. We're both gonna walk away from this. That example shows why if they'd have left that as it was and Rachel and Ross were paid more money for episode, that could have festered and resulted in a lot of bad shit down the line. The creators of a show, they didn't want any one particular friend to get more publicity, so they insisted that for the first couple of seasons, all publicity shots and all promo shots had to be all six members of the cast and they could only do interviews as a group. For people who haven't seen the show, you guys, can you describe what it's all about? Who wants to do this? Don't <laughs> all raise your hands at once. <laughs> Um, later seasons, they relaxed this ever so slightly because obviously you couldn't fit all of their massively swelling egos into the same room at the same time. But if you go look at any promo shot from the earlier seasons, you will see that it's all of them as a group at the same time with no one person being given more prominence over another. Is it true they were actually really good friends outside of the show? They were very good friends, as you can imagine as well. They went into these negotiations as a group to purely so they didn't want any resentment or any bad feelings or ill will. And every show apparently started with all six members of the cast giving a big group hug and just wishing each other good luck. <laughs> and there's a great story from Tom Selleck where he says, yeah, they were all really good friends and I was surprised by how close they were as a group. But it was kind of upsetting when I'm just stood there in the corner and they're all hugging each other. I just felt really left out. So the next time you watch an early episode of Friends, remember that just before that episode started filming, all of the friends shared a big group hug while a giant mustachioed man quietly wept in the corner. I know we keep shitting on likes, subscribe, but we kind of have to do it. So we're gonna do that and then we get to poop on Ross, yes? Okay guys, I really, really hope you enjoyed the video. Um, like it if you liked it, comment if we got any problems or any feedback below and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. And now I get to do my favourite thing and shit on a fictional character. So Ross, where do you fall on the spectrum? Like, nice guy, misunderstood, or like me, total abject piece of human excrement. I thought Ross was meant to be like a nice guy who always made decisions. No, no, he's a nice guy. So I'm sure you know this is a big fan of the show. Friends coined the term friend zone. What's it? That bullshit idea that women owe a man sex or a relationship just because he's friends with her for a very long time. And Ross epitomizes this. He's a shallow, manipulative piece of garbage. He's not that bad. Okay, let's uh, give you a few facts. You, I'm assuming like me, you've got every episode memorized in your head. Early season Ross, it's established he's in love with Rachel. And then he gets upset that Rachel never seems to see him as a nice guy, even though he's never put himself out there and made it known that he is available as like a um, romantic partner. He never tries to establish or make himself appear in her eyes as someone she could potentially date. He just sits there quietly festering in the corner, getting annoyed every time she dates another guy. She dates Paolo. Like, he ends up being a pretty, he ends up being a piece of shit later episodes. Early season though, or when you first meet him, you don't know. He walks into the set and he's just a happy-go-lucky foreign guy. He even smiles and introduces himself to everyone. What does Ross do? He sits in the corner, quietly talking with his friends like, oh God, that Paolo's an awful guy. Why wasn't Rachel date me? I'm nice. That's why I'm sat over here, shit-talking this guy I've just met, who Rachel clearly likes. I'm a good friend. That's why I would make a great partner for Rachel, which is why I'm sat here telling her she's got shit-tasting men behind her back. So Ross goes to China, doesn't he? Yeah. And then they, Rachel finds out, oh, Ross liked me. 
And then Ross comes back from China and he's got a girlfriend and he finds out through the grapevine, Rachel knows that you like her now and she kind of wants to like try a relationship or just give her some closure and tell her that you've moved on so she can move on as well. What does he do? He writes a list of all of her flaws on a piece of paper and then she finds it. And what does he do when she finds a piece of paper written by this guy who supposedly worships the ground she walks on telling her she's got fat ankles and she's just a waitress? He gets annoyed that she gets mad about it. Do you remember Ross's uh, ex-wife? She's a lesbian, she cheats on him, right? Yeah. Terrible thing, that's awful for anyone. But then again, she was a lesbian and she was confused. But she cheated on him, there's no excuse for that. He doesn't excuse the fact that Ross constantly belittles his um, uh, ex-wife's lesbian relationship. He doesn't miss a chance to shit on it and belittle it as being less than a real relationship. But that's doubled down on a later season. Do you remember when they get the nanny? Yeah. Freddie Prince Jr. And he plays a male nanny, so it's a man in a traditionally female role. This guy, who is established, is not only excellent at his job, and his daughter loves him and will be the best person for the job, he fires him because it's weird. And then, remember the other episode with his son Ben, who he never talks about? Mm. You know, the one who he finds out is playing with a Barbie doll? Yeah. And then he goes out of his way to try and make a play with the G.I. Joe, because he doesn't like the idea that he's being raised by two mums, he thinks he's going to grow up girly. You ruined Ross for me. Oh, but we're not done yet. What's the most famous thing that Ross and, happens between Ross and Rachel? When they're, when, they're on a break. when they're on a break. Ross never lets it go. Every time they bring it up, what does he say? We were on a break. Oh. We were on a break. <laughs> we were on a break. Uh, he refused to accept that she's upset and he spends episodes getting really, really annoyed about the fact she's still pissed off with him. Well, the thing that triggers him is when he forms up and marks in the background. And that's another, that's another thing he does. He doesn't have any trust in Rachel. He says to himself, oh, she's sleeping with Mark because I heard he was there. Earlier episodes, he said, oh, Mark just wants to sleep with you. You do realise your girlfriend's got agency of her own, right? Have you seen what Jennifer Anson looked like when she was recording those seasons? She's pretty fucking hot. Everyone wants to sleep with your girlfriend. But do you know what she doesn't want to do? She doesn't want to sleep with them because she's with you. Not only is it established that he's possessive, manipulative, he doesn't have faith in his own girlfriend that she won't cheat on him the first chance he gets. He constantly belittles Joey and Phoebe for not being as educated as him. Uh, there's an episode where Rachel, he wants her to quit a job because he doesn't like the fact she's working with Mark. Bearing in mind, Rachel's entire character arc is her becoming an independent woman with her own job and looking after herself. And he wants to immediately put that on hold because he's not comfortable with the idea she works with a man who's attracted to her. There's a thing in relationships called trust, I think. He doesn't trust his own girlfriend enough not to sleep with another guy. And what does he do when they break up? What's the first thing he does? Sleep with another person and then gets annoyed about it. What about, and as well, what about all the times that he lies to her and then gets pissed off when he gets found out? Because he originally, after they, he sleeps with the other woman, he tells all his friends not to mention it. He only gets annoyed and pissed off when Rachel finds out when he deliberately went to the effort of covering it up. Later episodes, when, like, when they're married to each other and he says, I'll get it in old, and then he doesn't, he says to his friends, no, I'm just going to not say that we're still married in the hopes that she'll eventually just get over the idea. And then when she gets annoyed about it when he finds out, what does he do? He makes it all about him by saying, I don't want to be the guy who's been divorced three times. So, in conclusion, Ross... Right. He's, he's such a piece of shit. <laughs>